Here we go. All right. Thanks for doing this, Steven. Appreciate it. All right, man. Here we are. I got to say, Bobby, it's a beginning of a chilly season, right? So there's a chill in the air. We're back in the backyard, and it's a nice way to do this. Taking advantage of it. Yeah. It's cold. Yep. Uh, I wanted to start out by saying that over the last year and a half, however long we've been in this, there's been a lot of doom and gloom in the musical community. I, Every right. time I talk to you, you had a positive take on this. Yeah. And I just want to say thanks for being a, uh, a beacon of positivity in a sea of confusion and turmoil. Here's my, here's my philosophy. We're here, then we're not here. So, while we're here, we might as well like have a good time and try to get something done. Because then you turn around and you're not here. I mean, that's the only two ways there are. Sure. Yep. You, you, got, you got what you're given and you try to make the best of what you have. Yeah, and there's no, like, we're just here for a pretty finite amount of time. Sure. So I would rather enjoy it. You know? Yeah. I mean, if it was endless, you'd be like, okay, maybe some days I'll, I'll whatever, that's going to be a bummy day. But, I'm like, this is it, man. Like, I would tell people, this is not the rehearsal. This is the gig. Like, this yeah. is it. Yeah. This is what we get. Like, that day in front of you, that's, that's it. Mm-hmm. Sure. I like that a lot. Uh, so you got a new record came out last month. The first. The first. Of? Of four. Yeah, but it's five. It's five. Because what? The sex mob record you don't know about, do you? No. Okay, let's start the first four. Then we'll get there. <laughs> All right, great. So Community Music Volume 1. Yes, sir. Tinctures in Time. Yes, sir. Community Music Volume 1. Yes. What's the idea behind Community Music? Well, this music I make now, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I was listening to Ben Porowski, the drummer, who plays so incredibly on this stuff. And then, I don't know what made me listen to it, but made me think about, like, when we made the second Spanish Fly record, Mm -hmm. Ben played on a lot of it. First Spanish Fly record, he just played on a couple tunes. And um, I went back and listened to it. And it was already some super unique stuff that only he could have done, and only he could have done while he was playing with me, and I only could have done it when I was playing with him. And I, that was, you know, close to 30 years ago. Wow. And it was already like, oh, we were creating some kind of, it wasn't as, it wasn't as like um, fo- formed as what we're doing now. But it was pretty unique, man. I don't know if you ever heard that second mm-hmm. Spanish Fly record, the ballet. And, um, you know, so I've always been writing this. So it's about every note you hear is part of this community. I mean, you know, me and Peter Affelbaum, that goes back almost 50 years. I mean, I was a, either, I, I think 11, I can't, I'll never forget, maybe I met him when I was 11, I joined his band when I was 12. I think mm-hmm. that's how it worked. And Doug Weaselman, I turned, I, you know, I, 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 I turned 22 on the road with him. Curtis Folks, I replaced him in the Lounge Lizards. Ben Allison, met him in college, when he was in college. So, you know, we kind of created this sound of playing together, and that's really what the music is. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm quite not even say, but of course, Charlie Burnham and, and Matt Munisteri, I mean, you know, it's, so it's not, it's the community that creates the music, it's community music. Mm-hmm. Like, they couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it without each other. Sure, sure. But then you have to craft the, you're setting the foundations for these well, pieces. Well, my name's on the top. Sure. You know. But you're thinking about, as you're writing this music, you're thinking about all these people. that Right, and, and what they stuff. can bring. And see, you know, I'm a big believer in improvisation. Mm-hmm. And I really, I'll tell you a funny Spanish fly story. Our last tour, when, before the first time we broke up, it kind of ended pretty darkly, man. It was like, you know, because, you know, a band that really relies on trust and sometimes if things just kind of get weird, it's just hard to get that music because it's not like you're putting on a show. You're improvising together. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> we play this gig. It just, sometimes it just wouldn't work, you know. You don't, One guy would be improvising and one would, and it just didn't, it just happened sometimes. Sure. It wasn't, like, bad. It just, you know. And afterwards, these, the Moscow art trio 
Have you ever heard them? No. Yeah, most people haven't. They're incredible. And for a while, they were working all the time in Europe. And it was like also a trio. It was French horn, Arcady, this, this virtuoso, piano player virtuoso. And I guess the third guy must have been a drummer. He probably also played some like Russian percussion, as I remember, like Eastern. And they put on this show, like, you know, it's improvisation, but like zippy endings, like, blah, 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 and they're really incredible. Blah, 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 you know, very like worked out. And of course, when you do that, the audience is like, ah, you know. And afterwards, the leader came up to us and says, uh, yes, improvisation, very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because it is optimistic to improvise. Sure. Because you, you could easily not get there. Yeah. Uh-huh. And if it's high risk, high reward. Yeah. And if you write something really great, you know it's science. You know how it's going to work out. I mean, right. it's, it's science. It's all about like vibrations and how people react to things. But um, so what I'm trying to say, what that gets back to is community music. Like within the music, a lot of times, I know if I write something, somebody will interpret it in an improvisatory way, knowing that that's not going to be played exactly how I write it. Like, mm -hmm. that's how they're going to approach it. And I like to even, you know, even when... It's, it's nice to have somebody improvising at some point during the song at all times. Sure. And when you have all these personalities, each one, you know, is going to bring something really specific. Mm-hmm. Sure. On a lot of these tunes, the way that you seem to approach it is to have the sort of structure of the music... And then you'll have the improvisational element of it sort of sprinkled in throughout. Rather right. than it being like sort of a bebop head, some, and then a million solos or a long right. set of Right, so, solos okay, so nature. you listen to music. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? What you just described, where does that come from? Well, I would think of it as coming from probably the old dance bands where you'd have to play for a while. and. Well, that's not what I'm thinking of. Okay. What are you thinking? Duke Ellington, 1939. Sure. Duke Ellington, 1940. Listen, Duke Ellington, 1941. Mm -hmm. Duke Ellington, like, sure, there was a song that had, people had a feature song, but all the band songs, here's one teasel for eight bars, and there's, there's four bars of Johnny Hodges. Look, but Cootie's playing a little something behind this little thing, and all through the song, that keeps happening. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. Yeah. And that, to me, is just such an interesting thing from my ear, from what I like to hear, because there's always a, the community's having this conversation, and it's just a different kind of music. Like I think for some people, it might they might don't know, yeah, because it is. If you try to formalize it, there's not really other people that make music like that right now. It's pretty, sure. yeah. But it's not like it's without precedent, I and mean, that's sure. what Duke did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're kind of a, you've spent a lot of time in the Duke Ellington world. Well, I, I fell in love with Duke Ellington in 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's funny. I'll tell you a funny thing. I always think about time. Sure. By the way, I just turned 60. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, you You're go. welcome. October Libra. Birthday. Libra. Yep. Here, I'm going to have you do something real quick. Do your scarf. Just make sure it's not on the microphone. It'll, it'll uh, right. make too much of okay, it. Here we go. Right. Before you before right. we go on. Okay. So um, I think about time a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, about, it was my, oh, here it was, it was the morning of my 60th birthday. And I said, what do I want to listen to? And I just looked at my records and, and the spine of this one, you know, when it's a box record and the spine's bigger, mm -hmm. and it's just said big letters, Duke Ellington, Fargo 1940. You know about this record? No. Oh, man, they found this record. It's all like when you grew up. See, when I was like really into record collecting, maybe, and, and learning about stuff, 18, 19, 20. They had found this recording of Duke Ellington playing a dance in Fargo, North, North Dakota. Okay. Ray Nance had just joined the band. Cootie had just left to join Benny Goodman. It's Rex. Ray Nance is maybe playing the first time they say it was. Who knows what it really was. Ben Webster, Johnny Hodges, Jimmy Blanton, you know, Barney Begard, you know, Lawrence Brown just playing so incredibly. Um... And uh, I listened to it. I just put it on. I said, that's the first thing I'm going to listen to on, 60, on my sure. 60th birthday. Uh -huh. I hadn't heard it in a long time. It just sounds so great. I mean, I hadn't heard it in so long. It sounds so different to me than when I first heard it. Sure. Because it was like the first time they had found like an air check of this band that it's like height mm -hmm. and playing sure. a dance. Um, 
And I said, wow, what made me so attracted to that music 40 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And I said to myself, well, what music is 40 years ago from right now? Defunct. Like the difference between now and defunct is the difference between defunct when I got to New York and Duke Ellington. Sure. Like, you know, it was, it was New York time. It was like that world, that kind of downtown wild world. And I was, for whatever reason, that Duke Ellington just spoke to me so hard, much. But even when I was younger, but in high school, but just kept going stronger and stronger. And I'd say there were probably 20 years where I listened to Duke Ellington every day. It was like religion. It was, yeah. like I, it was like I had to. It was like I have a cup of coffee. Like, well, you'd be like, like, what, you don't listen to Duke Ellington every day? <laughs> like, how do you know anything then? Sure. How do you know well, at least about music? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, you might know something about like I don't know, bowling. Sure. Anyway. That was an amazing band. Did oh, you uh, yeah. Did you ever get to see them? Oh, are you setting me up, or do you know the Duke Ellington story? No. Oh my God, this is a good story. <laughs> I, okay, right here. <laughs> Okay, know who taught me to do that? Who's that? Duke Ellington. When okay. I was in third grade, Duke Ellington, and there's, there's stuff, you could, might want to find a little link of, I'll send it to you, of when Duke Ellington went to Berkeley mm -hmm. schools. We had the first integrated school system. And I think it was even the first year of integration. The second year he came and visited, because Dr. Herb Wong was a famous educator, DJ, record producer. He had started this jazz program that Peter Applebaum and the original kind of kids that came out of it were Peter Applebaum and Rodney Franklin. And in a kind of satellite way, David Murray, just because he was the same age, but Herb Wong was bringing, started a jazz program, started in fourth grade. Hired Phil Hardiman and, and Dick Whittington to start teaching fourth like this fourth graders who were just learning their instruments how to play jazz. A so you had a jazz, writing charts for kids who were in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like six clarinets, seven trumpets, two trombones, Angela playing the, the, the left hand, because we didn't have a bass player, she played the organ, that little organ that bass, she went do, 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 Angela Berry. She played the bass line on the left hand, the organ, and we had a band, and swing, we always had like, of course, amazing drummers. And, um, so, Duke Ellington came. Now, this is before I was even in fourth grade. I wasn't even playing music, but he came. Dr. Herb Wong had brought him to Berkeley schools. And they visited some schools, and they did a big concert. I assume it was at the Berkeley Community Theater, and my mom brought me in third grade. My mom was really amazing, and she was like, of course I'm taking a seat. And he taught all the kids to, you know, to, uh, you know put down your left earlobe on one, snap on two. It's probably a little slower a bit to teach us to do it. And they say, that's how you be cool. That's how you be cool. Like, <laughs> and so I learned that in third grade from Duke Ellington. And he brought kids on to do the Funky Chicken. He had like a little rock tune he would do that, that he used to play. And he brought some of those kids from the schools. And there was a slideshow, as I remember it before, and there was a picture of him with our principal. And I thought, man, Duke Ellington's got to be important, man, because he's, he's got a slideshow. Pays right up there with the, the principal, man. It's like, this guy's got to be big time. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And, man, it's so amazing that he would go, I mean, given his role in American music, to show <laughs> up and be like, I'm going to hit these kids to this music and, like, bring this to the schools. And, yeah, you know. he was just, and that music, it's just like, for me, I don't know. For me, it's just the music. I just, you know, sure. I was just talking to my friend Matt Merowitz and talking about music and stuff. I said, for whatever it means, like, I still just really, like, enjoy listening to Gellington Jack Teagarden. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I don't like other music. It's like that music just still brings me, like, a lot of pleasure. Sure. That's the beauty of it, too, and that especially recorded music. I mean, that's, it's timeless. Yeah. I mean, it is of a time, but yeah. it's timeless. It's yeah. going to be that way yeah. forever. You can always find something in that. Yeah. So, yeah, to Gellington. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, but that's really where this music is coming from. Sure. See, I mean, I tell people, like, if you would think about Duke Ellington, the band, and the Art Ensemble of Chicago, that's what this music is. Sure. Because those are like kind of the main, I would say if you had to pick some main kind of hitching posts where this information kind of came from. Mm-hmm. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. You know. 
What is the... Give me a brief history of the Territory Bands, and what was your inspiration to start? So here's the story. Territory Bands were bands that played in what they called the Territories, the, like the North... The mid, the Midwest territories. There were Midwest territory bands, and I, I'm not like a, a, a you know, historian. Historian, I would call. In fact, the New York Times referred to me as a rogue historian of jazz. <laughs> I, I like that. That's yeah, a, a, rogue, that a rogue historian of jazz. <laughs> yes, because I actually play it. Um, but um, you know, in the East Coast. In the Gulf Coast, in the West Coast, you had kind of, it was a little more city or ports, you know, mm -hmm. port towns, sure. different kind of society. In the Midwest was a little kind of different society. And so that was, and that could be like St. Louis and, and Kansas City and Tulsa. But I think even like Richmond, Virginia, that was considered like territory band stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Anyway, so it was this kind of music, and it was what mu music was what people listened to. That's what music used to be. It wasn't like a product. It was like something that people went and they listened to, like it was music, and danced to it. So you're playing for dancing and listening, and you're also the loudest thing. Like there's no like amplifying yet. Sure. So like trumpet, like you know, I have to tell people like people don't realize. Maybe they, no, I don't think they do. They think Benny Goodman, right? They think like you know old people in like suits and stuff like that. Gene Maxwell used to tell me, man, you gotta understand, like, everyone had a jug under their, their seat. There were all these beautiful chicks in the audience. Like, I would say they were probably the nirvana of their time, like the loudest white dudes. Sure, yeah. You Benny know. Goodman's band. You know. Yeah, like, yeah, but we don't sure. think of him as that. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, think yeah. of Benny Goodman as Nirvana. Right. But in his time, that's what it was, this experience of loud, kind of beat-oriented music played by, like, young white people. Sure. A lot of testosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People dancing. Mm -hmm. And those are some crazy musicians in Benny Goodman's band. Oh, yeah. The original ones, you know? And um, It reminds me of my... I, was, I talked to my grandfather about this. He lived to be 95. Uh -huh. And he, he would go see Fletcher Henderson's band. At, yeah, with wow. uh, 17-year-old Ella Fitzgerald. No. Fletcher Henderson... See, I didn't even know that. Yep. I know she sang with Chick Webb's band, but she sang... Maybe that's... Chick Webb's band. Right, that's that what was you're right. right. You're right. So that yep. was the famous thing. In fact, someone told me there's a uh, someone just did a documentary about this. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and I'll tell you. That, yeah. But he told me he was. I was like, how'd your parents like jazz music? He's like, they hated it. Oh yeah, <laughs> so it was like Nirvana. Like it was over. so audacious. You have to yeah, think right. of the time. Like, think of the relative sound and feeling of 1937. And then this music just like roaring out. You know, it's always been the music roaring out. Yeah. And I think that roar, like that was about the lounge lizards, because I've been reading John Lurie's book. The lounge lizards had that roar. Mm -hmm. There's something about that when you get that roar going. And, um, you know, those acoustic instruments, they were the ones that could make the roar. Sure. They, we were roaring, man. Yeah. And it had to have been, I mean, that was part of the putting together a big band, too, is that you have that instrument, you can get that energy out of that. Okay, oh, yeah, so band. this goes back to, where did we start? Stu Gellington. Nope. We started at? Territory bands. Territory bands. Okay, so this is all coming from territory bands. So these sure. are bands, and oftentimes they were like two trumpets, a violin, a trombone, very rarely two trombones, three reeds, two reeds, and all the reeds played different reeds, and there was usually a, a bass or a, ban or a tuba and a banjo or guitar and a lot of those and a piano player. And that was this kind of music. And, um, you know, historically it's all connected to whatever you want to call it, Jelly Roll Morton and the blues and all that stuff. I mean, Count Basie had that big, big hit with the Jelly Roll song. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, a certain kind of rhythm, they call it the Midwest rhythm. I mean, they had a very... You know, it was exemplified by, you know, the Count Basie band, but, you know, it was a certain kind of beat and guys like Hot Lips Page. And um, so that's a territory bands. And they weren't f as formulated as the East Coast bands, which were slicker, the Chicago bands, you know, city bands. These were like a little, and then also music maybe a little more oriented towards blues and what we would call now either Tin Pan Alley or American Songbook. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because... 
to get less of that influence, I'd say, because they're not there in the midst of that, you know. And, um, and some super sophisticated writing, though, I mean, you know, Andy Kirk and Mary, Mary Lou Williams was in that band. But, you know, people call it riff-based music. They would say, because I think a lot of that music wasn't written. Sure. Or there could be eight written bars or, 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 or more or less, you know, but, but that music, like, developed on stage for people dancing and for songs happening. And um, so, anyway, that's what territory bands were. What era is this? This is, again, I would say, like, I'm just, you know, this is rogue historian. This sure, isn't, like, right. a, like official sanctioned stuff. 28 to 36. Okay. 37. And also, see, the music wasn't formalized as much. And there was still, like, a real, a, a, a big ragtime kind of influence, you know, just structurally with a song oftentimes, you know, the major to minor to blues thing, like, mm -hmm, sure. or minor to major to blues, stop time, these kind of little, going to a trio section, yeah. you know, all these devices, little eight, two bar chromatic tags between things, like mm -hmm. these little devices, nothing was formalized. Yeah. People were just throwing things around in the songs. Yeah. So it sounded like a march, you know, it might be a march, but then someone's like, like playing like some blues in the background. That could be a section of it. Sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff, as the whole kind of classic big band, you know, really, you know, not that he was the only guy, but Cy Oliver, like this idea of trumpets, trombones, saxophones, the three distinct sections, mm -hmm. you know, that came later. That was right. not necessarily what territory bands did. Sure. But it had that feeling of that music. Yeah. But it was more kind of gushy. Yeah, they were working it out. And yeah. For that reason, you get some kind of experimental stuff. I feel the same way about like the hot fives and hot sevens recordings. Like, it, it sounds like, okay, anything can happen. Right. We can do whatever we want. There's Which no... always freaks me out about people playing that stuff written, unless you were saying, like, it's like I'm performing it as classical music. Sure. Like, this is classical we're music. We're replicating this. But to call it jazz and do that, it's like, I mean, I understand why you would do that because it sounds just like jazz. Right. A little cleaner because you already know what's going to happen. Sure. But it's a different thing. Yeah, well, of course it's a different thing. You already know what's going to happen. Right. Of course it's a, those guys, they just did it. And then once you know what's going to happen, it's something else. I'm not saying it's not jazz, but it's not. Right. Sure. <laughs> so were you listening to that music and then you were inspired to put together a band of what that happened kind of was, instrumentation? What happened was, Hal hired me for a gig, Hal Wilner. Mm hmm. Uh, see, my daughter just turned 27, so 27 years ago, and 1994, and um, right, had she just been born? It's hard to remember. I think she had just been born. I said, I got this Robert Altman. I had done a little music for, he had done the music for the last Robert Altman movie, Shortcuts, and we kind of had like faux Spanish fly on that, mm -hmm. like me and Tronzo or some stuff on Shortcuts, and I guess actually Marcus was bummed. He, he didn't call too late, but Marcus got to do like, I don't know if it was an ad for it. He got to play something like that Greg Cohn did with Lane Pickett, like some sort of thing for it, a bumper. I don't know. Anyway, I got to play on it. Like, there's a little scene, and it's, you know, how just, how would always, like, add people to things. And as he, you met, he met you, he'd figure out, how can I add this guy to something, you know? Sure. And um, then he got called for the Kansas City movie. And that was kind of a big deal. And he's like, I got a gig for you. And he goes, um... I got this movie. I need you to like listen to this music. I'm gonna give you. You come by the office, and you give me these cassette tapes and, and xeroxes of of the record back of the records. And my job, I'm being paid. It's a gig. He's like, I got a gig for you, man. Because the house is really cool that way. He knew musicians needed gigs. Sure. That's the hardest thing about musicians figuring out how do you, how do you eat and, and yes. pay the rent and that stuff because right. we don't have jobs. We're not. It's not like oh, I got a job and every two weeks I get a check. Yeah. It's so it's, it's like, what do you do? Well, so anyway, you're lucky how Wilner calls you. Sure. And says, and he paid me, and my gig was to listen to this music. Because Hal didn't listen to music scientifically. So my gig was to kind of get this in my ear, figure out what is the connecting tissue to all this music. So when we listen, when people start, oh, sorry, skin a little chilly. When people start playing, I can say, yeah, cool, or I could actually physically say, hey, you know what, can you blah, 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 or don't blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. sure. and um, man, I guess it was three months, I made every Tuesday, go down to the office, 
another box, another box of cassette tapes and Xeroxes, and I listened to music, so I got paid. We so you're getting paid to just check out this music? Not just, I'm getting paid to check out this music. Okay. You see, you don't have to say just, because that- I don't mean to say just. Yeah, but, but you did. Well, I did say that. Yeah, so, okay, but okay. we're saying, right. I'm being paid to check out this music. Sure. The same way someone's being paid to check out stocks or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, but it's a, for a movie. So there is a commercial consideration. The whole thing about music is where does like the money thing come in? So yeah. we, we can get eat. Sure. <laughs> and a movie, it does, because people go to see movies. They didn't go see that movie. In fact, I saw it on TV and I realized it is kind of, <laughs> it's a curious movie, but the, the it has a, a weird pacing, I got to okay. say. Have you seen it ever, Kansas City? No. Oh, you should see it, man. It's no. like, I mean, you know, the Europeans consider it, like the European jazz people say, like, that's, I'll say it. They say that's the best jazz ever in a movie. Because it was Howl Wilder style. It was like chaos, man. Sure. It's fucking, excuse my language. It was <laughs> chaos, man. And it's like, it's like we got, like, James Carter, Josh Redman, Don Byron, Olu, Nick Payton, really young Nick Payton, James Zoller, Curtis Folks, Clark Gayton, Ron Carter and Christian McBride at different times, Victor Lewis on drums. And, and they needed two piano players. They needed Count Basie and Mary Lou Williams. So we had Jerry Allen and Cyrus Chestnut. That's amazing. Oh, and Fathead Newman and Jesse Davis. <laughs> that's Yo. crazy. Yeah. yeah that's a, and then yeah. David Murray showed up today. And, oh, and then Russell Malone and Mark Whitfield at different times on guitar. And Hal thought these guys were going to be able to conduction the music. Okay. Because Hal was such an optimist. He was like, well, of course, these guys, you know, you say, we'll play the song of Butch here and Butch will, because Butch Morris came, uh -huh. and he'll just do his thing, it'll be like, happen like magic. Sure. And I was just going, yeah, it's not really how it works. Because Hal, Hal started working with, like, Ross on Roland Kirk the first uh -huh. time. And when you work with people like that, he literally assumed that every musician could just, like, well, if I can hear a song, you guys are great musicians. Like, yeah. like I know how it goes, but, yeah, sure. but you guys are great. And actually, for most of us, it's not the way. We, we have, a, a, you have an amount, but very few people know it. No, nobody knows everything. I've right. been around enough people. Sure. Nobody knows everything. And so they didn't know this music. And Hal was like, oh, don't worry. They have arrangements over at the university. I go over to the university, and they got, like, thinking, like, oh, man, someone's, like, transcribed this stuff. It's like... They had like those stock arrangements, those cheesy stock arrangements before like none of the songs he wanted. And if they were, they were just like a stock. I go back here. Yeah. Anyway, it was chaos. It was chaos, man. Like chaos. <laughs> like, but not the good chaos, like the bad chaos. And there's a deadline and you're doing No, the deadline, deadline. Where it's a movie, it's alive. No, it's live. It's live. They're recording the mo the the music during the scenes. So you got like Harry <laughs> Belafonte and like Steve Buscemi and the band's right there and they're talking and the band's playing at the same time. That's he hilarious. wanted Altman, that's how Altman wanted it. Uh -huh. Altman wow. wanted like it, the, the, the movie, half the movie takes place in this club. Yeah. And in this club is the Count Basie band and Ben Webster coming through. Oh, sorry, and Craig Handy. Right, we had that many tenors. Craig Handy, James Carter, and, and Josh Freeman. There's two tenor battles because they're supposed to be Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, and Ben Webster. Mm -hmm. um, not, they're not supposed to be him. The thing is, because these are real jazz musicians, no one's imitating anybody. They're just such bad dudes, man. And everyone's just like, and it's chaos. And you got all these guys, and it's total how. The tension of all these people from these different scenes who maybe don't know each other. Sure, And right. trust each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone forces everybody to just like, that was the magic of how. So anyway, we did this movie. What ended up happening was I had to write charts every night. I mean, I did, you know, we formed a few out, but none of us had ever really done this. I was like, well, you can write charts, right? I'm like, um, yeah. It's like, okay, so tomorrow, and they, they hand me like a, a script. Like, and the script was written like, you know, piano, bass, and guitar playing whatever song it is. You know, so-and-so walks in, starts playing, and like, so you kind of need to kind of orchestrate like, a, like this scene. Huh. And... You know, I just did it the best I could. I mean, it was super primitive. But everybody was, I, so I told the guys in the band, that's the good thing about being a musician, musician, like a working musician. I just told them, I was like, look, here's the deal. We're in this. This is how it's going to work. Like, I'm going to have a little lead sheet for you guys. Sometimes, sometimes a lead sheet, sometimes an arrangement, whatever we can do to make it work. We'll just rely on, you know, you guys being great musicians and me being clear about what we're going to play. And you guys know how to do this. And 
let's not make a big deal about it. Like, the real deal. Like, with real musicians, you don't have to, like, spell everything out for yeah. them. They got a lead sheet. They know what key it is. Here's the cues. Here's where you're coming in. You come in here, play this thing. And Nick Payton, <laughs> listen to the endings on every tune. Nick would just create these, like, unbelievable endings. He's, like, 22 years old. I'm like, where does this even come from? But like I knew, you have all these musicians. You just be clear. This boom, you come in this course. You come in. Here. Okay, here's a little background we're gonna throw here. Blah blah blah. These guys are so good, man. And it was it was. No one had ever tried to do this. Sure. Like like they're in the scene, and you got like Joshua Redman and James Carter going at each other. Like while people are acting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even better too, because the people are doing the scene. It's like it's a movie, and you guys had to have been like right in the music, like yeah. having a. You know, no, it was so a it, blast to do it, even if it was a little... It was incredible. Chaotic. What a gift. But it was really, like, no one ever, ever tried to do that. But no one really saw the movie. Um, anyway, I get back. Uh, Bill Frizzell has just poached my band. You know, and uh -huh. so I had... Because you were playing regularly... At, at Tonic. The... We, had, we had Friday nights at Tonic. I, Bill, he's not going to see it anyway. But it's just said as a loving joke, because Bill Frizzell is, like, the greatest ever. Right? Let's just let's be clear about this, like who Bill Frizzell is. And Kenny had already been playing with him on and off, and Sex Mob was touring, and he heard Tony, and it's back when the period, not that anything Tony doesn't do is amazing, but he used to do this thing where we'd be playing, um, Abba song, Fernando. And he'd do a thing where he's like playing two melodies and then playing bass other parts with his foot. <laughs> And, you know, we've been playing rock clubs, of course. You know, we, that's what we were doing with Sex Mob. And Bill came, and he was just like, whoa, called Tony up. So then he had Tony and Kenny. Well, that's my, that's my band. So yeah. I had these Friday nights at Tonic, and they were packed, man. They were like a cultural thing happening. I had a good cultural. And I said to myself, like, well, like, I got a night. I've been, like, obsessed with this because I kept... There were songs I had been obsessed with from listening to that we hadn't gotten to, certain songs. Because, you know, at a certain point, that that's how it was Hal's magic. He could just take a list of 300 songs and will it, and he could keep 300 songs in his head. Wow. I can't. I have to have notes. Sure, sure. That's something else. For the people who don't know, yeah. maybe we could do a little overview of who Hal was. Hal Wilner invented something that we all think is this kind of normal, which is the idea of like a tribute concert or a tribute record where you have all different kind of people you not, wouldn't expect doing something, what they call cross-genre or whatever like that. In 1980, when Hal was in his early 20s, he had this idea to do a Nina Roder record. Okay. And he did a record, and it's like, you know, it's the best. It's Jackie Byard. It's Carla Blay. It's, you know, David Amram. Uh, you know, all these unbelievable jazz musicians. Muhal Richard Abrams. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just incredible musicians. But he got, not, not the whole band Blondie, but Debbie Harry and Chris Stein, who were like Blondie. Sure. So he based, and Blondie was, you understand, Blondie was like one of the biggest bands in the world. In the world, not just <laughs> the United States. I mean, Take a look, man, how many records Blondie sold. Sure. He gets them on this record. The first song is Jackie Byard. Moo Hall's on it. This is 1980, man. No one had even ever thought like. And Hal just had the greatest ears, but completely unconventional the way he approached everything about life. Sure. Because it wasn't just music with him. It was, he knew every poetry, and he knew all, all the poets, and he knew all the filmmakers, and he just... And he worked at Saturday Night Live, so he was part of that comedy world. He knew so much about comedy. And so that was a huge influence. When I heard this record, the Nina Rota record, it was the first summer after my first year of college. And I go to my friend's house, Cecilia Engelhart, and there were three sisters. The dad's a jazz musician, an instrument maker, and he had the hippest records. He just had the hippest Brazilian records, the hippest jazz records, the hippest Horace Silver records. He's like, hey man, he say, hey man, hey man. He still says, hey man, check this record out, and he puts it on, and it was like, oh, this is what I've been waiting to hear. Like this idea of it's all one thing. Mm -hmm. Like you could hear Jackie Byard, 
and you could hear a collar arrangement, and you could hear a muhal arrangement. Bill Frizzell's on it. Check this out. Here's how people used to say how could see around corners. It's Bill Frizzell's first record recording, real real recording, I think. I think he had recorded his first. And who else is their first real recording? Whitney and Branford Marsalis. Wow. Because On this Nino Rota thing you're talking about? Yes. That's because crazy. William Fisher did an arrangement. Do you know who William Fisher is, was? He might still be alive. No. He was a, one of the great Atlantic arrangers. Okay. Yeah, one of the classic Atlantic arrangers. Wrote a lot of hits, very great. And Hal had worked for Joel Dorn, who was another famous producer, who has a staff producer at Atlantic, who did all the Yusuf Latif records and Fethead Newman records and Rossan records. That's all Joel Dorn. Mm -hmm. Joel begat Howard. I mean, how, begat Hal. So, Hal hired William Fisher. It's like, oh, I'm gonna record, because William Fisher was a guy like, you know, get called for like, you know, Roberta Flack records and that stuff. But he was a very creative guy, you know. Sure. But he also did stuff for the Cannonball. He's very great, futuristic writer. And I think the story, it must be, because I know he went to school with Ellis Marsalis and Alvin Batiste, so he must have been like, oh, because why else would he call him? He's like, call Ellis's kids. They're like, they just got to town, they're amazing. Give him a break. Sure. I'm sure it's, I've never asked those guys about it, but I'm sure when I see them, I will. It'll be interesting to ask. But anyway, that's how. And I heard this music, and I'm like, yeah. Like, just like when I heard Defunct. You know, growing up in Berkeley, we had all this music. We had avant-garde jazz and swing jazz and Jimi Hendrix and Latin music, and we had all this stuff to listen to. But they were all like different people playing them. Sure. And in a different place. And I heard Defunct, and I was like, whoa, it's all that stuff. It's avant-garde jazz, it's Hendrix, it's swinging, it's punk rock, it's Latin music, you know? And this idea of like, you don't, you just let the music, you know, why wouldn't you want to have all this stuff in your music? Yeah. Yeah, so that's how it was. He just let everything happen in his music. And then he started using me for, you know, arranging. He just, and he found out, and he had like, arrange, you know, people he liked. And I emptied huge show, you know, and the thing about him, you'd empty a show and you'd be like, it'd be like, whatever, you 2 and Elton John, and it could be anybody. Or it could be, the, or it could be, you know, uh, um, you know, Henry Grimes. Sure. Like you do the show, it'd be the same show, you know. How would be the only guy that would do that? Like that's the thing about how, there's other people who do that, but they don't really love jazz. They say they do. And I'm not saying like in a disparaging way. I'm just saying like, no, you don't love jazz the way you love Led Zeppelin. Sure. That's loving jazz. Yeah. When it's like, you understand it. And it's a thing, maybe not everyone feels it that way. Mm -hmm. But Hal felt it that way. Sure. Hal really felt it. That, like, that improv, he loved improvisation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and it was really important to me because I, I got paid for the things I did with him. Sure. Because that's the whole thing. He'd be like, you know, why don't you just, you know, why don't you do, like, if, yeah, you could do the same kind of music, but if you have, like, Bono. Do you know about the U2 record, that, the, the live U2 show? No. <laughs> this is such a good, so I have, a, I got arrangements on a U2 record. Okay. That's out now. But it's the Sex Mob Orchestra and the Sun Ra Orchestra together, live <laughs> with U2. With U2. Okay. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's amazing. So it was a total amazing Hal thing. So, you know, sometimes I work a lot, and sometimes I don't. And that's just part of being a musician. So I was working a lot because I had this gig with my friend Gina Gershon, who's a famous actress. You know, she is. She's an old friend from college. Wow. And she uh, got a show at, um, what's the place, you know, the Carlisle. Okay. And she asked me to put together a band. I put together this awesome band for her with, she, uh, with Jerome Jennings and Brad Jones and, and Eli Oh, I can't remember the space around Eli's last name. Eli from Saturday Night Live. Oh, come on. I'm going to have to get back. To, I'm okay. so embarrassed. I can't remember his name right now. But he is so great. Um, Eli Jams. That's his, you can email him there. Anyway, so I get a phone call. And, and Hal like, was famous for like, not picking up the phone or answering. But he was also famous for calling you at like 1.32 in the morning. So I'm like kind of spaced out. I've been doing the show at the Carlisle, like, watching some TV. See, the phone rings like 1.30 in the morning. Hal. Well, Hal calls, you pick up. Because he's not, if he's calling you 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. What are you, uh, Stephen, uh, what are you doing on a, uh, Sunday and Monday? I said, man, Hal, this is great. I, I'm doing the show with Gina, but we have Sunday and Monday off. I was like, 
okay, uh, well, uh, I might have a gig for us well, with you two, and I think I'm going to get the Sun Ra Orchestra too, so uh, just see if you can get it, okay? I'm like, all right, how, how let me know? Okay, well, I'll drop, blah, blah, blah. I think we're going to get this. That's because, so the next day, I, you know, call lawyers, like, yeah, I think it's going to happen. You know, Hal's got to get the Sun Ra guys. Of course, it's total chaos. He does end up getting, because it's Hal. Like, he says he can do it, and it turns out, like, <laughs> he's told you two they could do it, and he finds out they're in Australia. I didn't know they were Australia. <laughs> <laughs> He's freaking out. He's always promised you two because because you two was like, oh, they would always call Hal for things, and they say, oh, we're doing a big show, it's a free show at the Apollo, for like serious satellite. It was it wasn't like a ticketed show, a special event. Uh-huh. Oh, we're gonna use horns, and Hal's like, oh, well, everyone uses horns at the Apollo, so if you're gonna use horns, you have to use Sunra. And they were like, who's that? Because you know they're from they're from Ireland. They right. They need. They were like poor kids from Ireland. How they, you know, by the time they would know about Sun Ra, they were too rich to know about Sun Ra. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'd be surprised if, if Bono was like, well, we got to get Sun Ra's orchestra on this. Or, no, you know. it was told how. Yeah. And he said, and they were like, okay, how? If you say we got to get, that's what we're going to do. Then, like, Bono says, let it be done. We're getting Sun Ra. And he, so let's, he, like, he says, you, you pull in your guys, and then we'll Sun Ra's guys will match them up. Because also he knew that that way it could still sound tight like a rock and roll horn section. Mm-hmm. Like, get me people. I got a great band. I got Frank Green on lead trumpet. And um, I got Bree on second trumpet. And I got um, Curtis Folks and uh, Earl McIntyre and Lakeisha Benjamin on alto. James Carter. We flew in James Carter, of course. Hal's like, oh, I got to get James. Because Hal just loved. I mean, you know who loved James? Lou Reed loved James Carter. Mm. We were going to get it. Yeah, if Lou had died, we would have got to him to make a big band record with James Carter. He wanted to do it. Wow. Yeah. Um, and of course, bringing on baritone. And then we had like, and then Hal somehow figures out how to get like five Sun Ra guys back from Australia in time to do this, including Marshall. And, uh, you know, Marshall's like 95, maybe he's 93 at that point. And I knew he just got back from Australia. And I was like, I said, you know what? I had to print out, all, of course, I'm doing everything. It's all last minute, printing all these parts out, taping them up. And I was like, yeah, man. <sighs> I'm not going to give Marshall parts, man. I'm just going to let him, like, blow, you know. And I said, you know, just in case, I'll, I'll print parts, but I'm not going to tape them. I just got, there's too much shit, you know, all this long, <coughs> long stuff to do. And uh, the show up, Marshall's like, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've met him before through Hal things. He's the nicest guy. And through other stuff through CMS. We got some music from me. I said, no, I said to him, I said, uh, Marshall, you know, yeah, you can just blow, man. You don't have to read charts. He's like, no, no, I want, I want charts, Stephen. Fuck, I've got tape of charts from Marshall. <laughs> puts on his glasses, you know. Because the funny thing about, other thing is like, so certain keys, like transpose, like guitar keys transpose to very weird keys for alto and baritone. Sure. Like a lot of sharps. Yeah. So I was like, man, I'm not going to make Marshall read all this stuff. Because even with simple music, you got six sharps on it. I was like, oh. Anyway, of course he played great. And uh, what a character. And uh, what, what, what did this come from? We were, they were, what did we get? To, how did we get to the Sun Ross story? Well, you were talking about how and then putting together the U2 concert. Oh, well, I and guess then, what I was saying it was the last thing I did with him. But that's coming out. It's like it's actually oh, wow. is, it actually is out. It's, you're supposed to send it to me. But it's only available if you join the U2 fan club. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So I'm, but it's kind of cool, man, because of how... Yeah. Like, but I remember the first time I worked with you two, he had called me. We were doing this big benefit. They were just to do their own thing. I was, you know, working with the band. He comes in. Oh, yeah, sorry. He says to me, uh, can you go to the next room? Uh, you, you two's having, like, you know, they're fighting about how to do this David Bowie song. And we need you to come in and, like, kind of mediate. <coughs> I don't know these guys. I walk in, I was like, oh, okay, I brought, because they probably said, bring in your musical, because one guy's saying he's right, one guy's saying he's right, you know, obviously. So I say, I introduce himself, to him, and I said, okay, just, let's just get this out of the way, like, so, do I say, like, uh, what, was it, I, do I say, Edge, you're fucking up, or do I say, the Edge, you're fucking up? <laughs> 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 and he says, whatever you want. I said, okay, because I got to know how to do this. And I just thought, like, okay, like, you know, like, yeah, you yeah. know. But they were were having an art, you know, it's a funny thing with people who don't think of music scientifically. Yeah. It's all feels. So for them, 
we might not be able to tell the difference between four bars and six bars or four bars and eight bars. It could seem like it, literally exactly the same. You, they could be like, well, what's the difference? Yeah. Because they're not counting it. It's like a, a feeling that comes to them. Mm -hmm. And then they get the next feeling. Right. So you don't have this like science thing to like help you out. Sure. So anyway, we worked it out. Yeah. Do you feel like you think of music scientifically? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But when I play, I try to just play. But yeah. when I listen to it and when I write it, it's all science. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So let's go back. So some of the so I think where we're coming from with the with the how stuff is you you also have this approach that is you're gonna put anything you want into the mix. Right. And it's all the, it seems to me what you're looking at just from talking to you now is the energy of it. The, the energy of the old Benny Goodman band might be the same energy as Nirvana in a different time period. But if you can capture that energy, it doesn't matter what style of music it is. Exactly. It's all going to fit in the same thing. Right, because it's all the same music. Right. It's just in a different environment. Sure. So all the same, like, you know, like what, what you know, people used to say shit like, oh, like, oh, Bobby Hackett would be corny, but Wayne Shorter is hip. Well, how about they're both hip or they're both corny? It's like, it's like what, like, what are you using to call these things? Like, yeah. you know, what's what is the meaning of this stuff? It's just music. It's just music that's like coming to people. Yeah. You know, sure. and it has to do with the environment it's in. Like, both the musical environment it's in, and, you know, how it's being played. Is it in a concert hall? Is it for a dance? Is it for a club where people are drinking or eating? You yeah. Know? Sure. So it's going to be a different thing. Yeah. Did you, ever, um, did you ever read David Burns' book, How Music I Works? I love that book. It's cool, I right? I think it's a, such a good book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really, that changed my perspective a little bit to think about the environment in which music is made has such an impact. I mean, you kind of know that intuitively, but to well, think about I, it, I it knew it very thing. quickly because when I got to New York, I'm hanging out at Danceteria and dressed to go to Danceteria. And then I'd like walk into Sweet Basil, Vanguard. They look at me like I was crazy. Because I had been in such a different environment. So obviously, um, so the music's going to sound different in every environment. That's just, that's just the way it is. Because that music they were playing at Dance Interior was pretty damn darn different. And then what we did was we figured out this way, like with the knitting factory and tonic, that we had a, an environment that was kind of... Take that microphone, I'll put it on the outside so you don't have to worry about it. The thing is, with Tonic and the Knitting Factory, we made a place where you could hear improvised music, but it, I think it felt a little bit more like a dance, not that it was like a dance interior, but it was kind of looser than the jazz clubs, mm -hmm. where certain people just, people like me, who would love jazz, would kind of feel uncomfortable, because people would look at you like, you're crazy. Sure. And yeah, we were crazy, but it was a good, you know what I'm saying? So like, you know, we were like playing, We'd be playing these, like, you know, the first MTO stuff and the original stuff. We're playing those old songs. Oh, we were getting to how I started the band. Yeah. That's how this whole thing started. Okay. So I had this night, and I just had been doing this stuff with Hal, and I said, man, these songs have been in my head. They won't leave my head. I can't stop listening to them. Like, even though I wasn't paid to listen to them anymore, like, I kept listening to them. Sure. I said, well, what if I just, like, put together a band and played these songs at Tonic and just saw what happened? And that's literally how it started. I think I had two, maybe three songs written out and a couple lead sheets and then did some jamming. That was the first MTO gig. The second gig, I probably had four arrangements, and we got a European tour out of it. Okay. Because it, was, it had been Lester Bowie's funeral. And, man, you know, I was pretty lit up. I had been emotional that day. And, you know, I think in honor of Lester, I had a cigar and was drinking whiskey, which I usually didn't do. Sure. And so I was feeling pretty good. And we started off by playing St. Louis Blues. And I don't know if you know the version from Rope Dope of St. Louis Blues with Joe Bowie and Lester Bowie. Mm -hmm. And we just went for it. And we've been playing St. Louis Blues to start every gig ever since. Like, that's, that, that version oh, wow. of St. Louis Blues got me my, a European tour with, like, on my second gig, and it still had been a rehearsal. And I already had a European tour. Sure. That's a good sign. Yeah. And we played, and still people come up to me and they'll hear the whole thing and go like, man, that's St. Louis Blues arrangement. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I know, because it's not an arrangement. 
you know, I got two written courses, maybe three written courses now I use. I, I start with one written course and then the second written course. And about a year and a half ago, I added uh, a course of the Serby Nichols song. <coughs> but that's it. The rest of it is improvised. Wow. And people just they, they think it's the greatest arrangement they've ever heard. Sure. Like, like heavy arrangers. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's amazing. But it's the people that you have that you've been working with for so right. long. And, and they I know, know how to... like, if I go like this, especially especially in the old days, I'd be like, like to the baritone, go like this, and the clarinet like this. Like, hit a chord, but, like, let's start working. Let's see what we can find here. Sure. And it was just those guys, like, okay, I'll play up here, and then someone with the air guy, it's not that high. Like, <laughs> the kicks, like, come on, man. The air just like, goes so high. It's like, no, that sounds stupid, man. Right. Right? No, I don't want to sound stupid. I just want to play, like, I know the baritone. Like, yeah, right. So, but uh, <laughs> but then we got that thing, and then they could, they'd find their own, like, they invested in it. You know, they're not playing my music, they're finding their yeah, resonance. Yeah, sure. That seems to come back to the community music idea, is that, because it, it is, it's so often you show up in a circumstance where, oh, everything's written out, you've got a little, you got a solo over here, you know, do what you can, but it is, it, you, you take on a different uh, ownership of the music if you have a creative contribution to it. Right. And it makes it fun. It makes it a part of your, you know. Right, and also I write the sections a little more expansive than most people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mean open-ended? Just the way the instruments relate to each other. Okay. What do you mean by that? Well, let's say especially like typical big band writing. The five saxophones relate to each other a certain way. Yeah. The four trombones relate to each other a certain way. Trumpets religious. Well, I write it, maybe this note you're relating to like a violin and a clarinet, and then four notes later, maybe it's just you and a saxophone. Sure. So you're always changing how your sound is coming. It's as if you're not part of a section that kind of stays, you're always in a different section. Yeah, right. Sometimes you're a soloist, sometimes like you're the middle voice, mm -hmm. sometimes you're a top voice. And that's going to shape the color of the whole thing as you go. And so. the energy. Because yeah, if sure. different people do it, they're going to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. Some guy might say, well, fuck, I'm going to do this. I'm going to like play sharp and like just like get that over the thing. And some guy's going to be like, no, I'm going to like take that and tuck that in, you know. Sure. And, you know, everyone's going to have a different way to, to do stuff. You know, these, so. And it's got to keep it interesting. You stand in front of the band. It's, a diff it's going to be a different thing every night, even in terms of, not even as an improvisational thing, but just as a way that people breathe their yeah, own creativity music. And that's why it's when I hear even... Most bands, I think they have the potential to do that. I don't think maybe the people want them to do that. Yeah. And I don't think sometimes the musicians realize <clears throat> that they can do that. Like, yeah, why not? Like, yeah. it's jazz, right? Like, like, look who Gil Evans, everyone say they love Gil Evans. Oh, I love Gil Evans. Well, look who Gil Evans used. Like, look who's playing that music in yeah. 1956. Mm -hmm. He has to throw a few straight men in there. Right. But there's a lot of characters. It's amazing, yeah. You got your Johnny Coles yeah. and your and your Steve Lacey and, you know, like maybe sometimes, you know, yeah. Jimmy Cleveland was so, you know, these guys, man, that were just like, you know. Yeah, and it's Johnny Coles is such a creative guy, and there he is playing like fourth or fifth trumpet or whatever it was on those recordings. Well, my like... trumpet teacher did a lot of gigs with Johnny Coles. In fact, I, saw, I, read, I heard this great interview with John Coles recently and uh, he's talking about you know being a good big band trumpet player how mm -hmm. important it was how important phrasing is because really if you think about what John Coles did he made his living playing third trumpet basically sure I mean he wasn't in the messengers he wasn't in horses band mm -hmm. he didn't play with Max and played with Mingus for a while yeah which are those are great those recordings are amazing you know I don't think Johnny ever had like a real Oh, he was Herbie Hancock for you, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Um, but mainly played in big bands to make a living. Yeah. You know. It's huh. amazing. Because that's what you could do on a trumpet. Like, that right. was a way to make a living. That yeah. wasn't weird. It's like, oh, of course. Like, what else are you going to do? Sure. Yeah. This is what we got. That's what trumpet players do. You play big bands. Yeah. So, the, we go back to the first Millennial Territory Orchestra record. Uh -huh. And you've got songs that are... Like, you've got, like, a great just swing and arrangement of Pennies from Heaven. Right. And you've got a super soulful, deep version of Sign Sealed Delivered. 
and it's all part of the same feeling. Like the whole thing is cohesive, even though you've got these different eras and different styles of music. Right, because like they're not different eras anymore because they're all old. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all old music. Interesting. I mean, right. that's an interesting perspective thing because in a hundred years, no, that's why I would tell people. And... I'm at, even at Columbia, I'm in Columbia, NYU. I was going to NYU because I did go to Columbia for two years, and everyone thought like, oh, it's like so hip to be playing like Wayne Shorter shit from like you know uh, that Miles stuff. I mean, like, yo, this stuff is old music, just like Jelly Roll Morton. <laughs> sure. I mean, it's cool, but like, it's no hip than playing Jelly Roll Morton. Yeah. Like, so don't like. So people were always like this kind of hierarchy. I was never into the yeah. hierarchy thing. Sure. And, mm -hmm. and I'm really feeling it now because, you know, now I've just bringing so much stuff like the band and so many triads in my music now. Yeah. And there's this funny hierarchy thing where people feel like, well, if the chords aren't complicated, it's like some sort of lesser music. Sure. And I'm like, well, actually, it's actually a lot harder to play, to be honest. Yeah, sure. Like, I play that really hard music. Yes, there is some shit so hard I can't play. Most of the hard music I played. Yeah. I would say. There is, like, the super hard, you've got to be a virtuoso, be able to read 11-8, like, while you're, like, on Quaaludes. Yeah. Like, right. yeah, like, you know, some Peter Evans, like, like yeah, yeah. Right, right. no, I, I guess, yes, I cannot play that. Yes, I, sure, right. I cannot play that. But, but most things, it's like, yeah, music. It's like you practice well, if you practice enough, you figure out how to do it. But sim this very simple music, simple, in the sense that structurally, Like that thing I learned from Levon about these songs, man, are just such great songs. When you play a song for a person, it just delivers something so beautiful. Like, why would I not want to do that? Yeah, sure. Like, this is beaut This is like such a level of beauty here. Mm -hmm. Just to play a song for a person. And not necessarily embellish it and throw a million things and abstract it. But it's kind of funny because I, I think sometimes people are like, whoa. <laughs> it's like. Sure, because you know, they expect it to be. You like so much stuff. Right. And I like stuff. Yeah. Stuff's good. You don't need it. it beca it's become sort of a. Mm, it's become like you're supposed to have a certain level of complexity or whatever. But yeah, if the song is good, it's, it's the same whether it's, you know. I mean, I, I still don't care. Or, say again? I don't care. Right, yeah. So anyway, but I think you find that in the new music. I think it's a lot of it's very straightforward. It's like, it's like, just because it's like triads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, but it's very specific. You know, the structure's always specific. Not, not always. There are two like minimalist style pieces, you know, that's not so specific. But most of them are just like Ellington, through composed. Yeah, Like, sure. start to one place, you just keep writing, you just keep reading. Like, someone might be improvising, but you're reading the whole time. Yeah. There's always, you know, and that's the, how, that's the difference between this music. It's like there's always somebody reading something. And there's all, and not always, but there's usually somebody improvising. Yeah, okay. It's just both at once. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So you, the first MTO record, you've got all these different songs that are arrangements of songs that you wanted to arrange. Right. This record now, Tinctures in Time, is the first one that you've done all original. Right. Pieces. Yes. Right. Is it, have you done original pieces not before? Not from MTO. You've never no, done original? No, that's not really true. The second record has a little kind of groove piece, and then the, the Sly record had... We later put out three originals that were, like, inspired by Sly that are, like, on the... I don't know. Back then it was, like, iTunes. And sure. I guess that's called yeah, Apple Music add, now. Right. Some stuff you don't get paid for. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Anyway, we, yeah, but they were, like, they were originals inspired by Sly. Mm -hmm. That would like kind of go with that music, like yeah. the idea, like, okay, it's a little more stuff based on what I've been hearing Sly. But it's the first time, so I'd ever done a large ensemble music, so I was like, kind of going like, what is this stuff? Like I played it for Hal, because Hal was always my sounding board. You're talking about the Sly stuff? No, the new this, stuff. This record, Tinkered yeah, time. gotcha. Because uh -huh. I don't think, I mean. Have you ever heard music like this? No, I have not. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I don't think anyone has. No. And, and, and people call me up, be like, you know, like people who really know music. And they're like, great compliment. They're out listening to it. And I said, like, you're the only person in the world who could have done this. This is like you. This is who you are. Yeah. And that's why I feel like, wow. Look, 
you know, it's very hard to get so-called traction with things in this world. I kind of like, of course, it's better if you do, but if you, if I don't, I don't kind of take it personally. But um, I just think it's kind of because I think there's, there's these elements that if people, you know, a lot of people understand the band Los Lobos, you know. But it's not the band of Los Lobos, and it's not Duke Ellington, right. and it's not Steve Reich. Mm -hmm. It's just this music I make. So yeah, so I asked Hal, I said, what is this stuff? He goes, well, it's, like, it's not like it's nothing I've never heard you do before. He goes, it's Bernstein music. Yeah. It's like kind of been writing this stuff for other people, like on other people's songs. Like kind of this is the elements I've been using. And it's the first time I tried to like sit down. And a lot of these pieces like I worked on for a while. Like we, I brought it, we played it, brought it back, changed it, boom, 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 kept changing it. A lot of these, which I, you know, because I didn't really know what I was doing. I know. I know what it's gonna sound like. Uh -huh. I knew what it sounded like on the computer playing it, but not until these guys got hold of it. Well, I know what is this music gonna feel like. What's sure. You know. Yeah, and with that with that music, it's got to. I mean, the feel of it and the way people interpret it and right. everything is such a big part of it. You right. can't hear the MIDI on Sibelius or whatever. Is not right. Gonna give and it. so, um, yeah, but it's all that stuff I've been kind of been playing this whole forty years. Sure. But it's just now. It's a little more focused. No, it's formulated. Well, I hope it's more focused, but it's formulated in a different way. Sure. It's like formulated in this kind of, um, I would call it Ellington-esque mm -hmm. sure. way. Yeah. What was the process in writing that music? Just write. Just write? Yeah. Do you Do you sit down every day and say, I'm going to write for this amount of time? You just have, or is there music comes to your head and you're going to sit down and write it? Or how this do you stuff also, it? I was <clears throat> going through a lot of stuff where, you know, family things. My sisters had gotten really hurt in a bad accident. Spending a lot of time just kind of like in California, taking care of things. And at night, I'm like, what am I going to do? So I just take a hit and write. Yeah. Like, I'm not at home. I'm like here, like, taking care of these things. So, be on a plane eight hours. What are you going to do? Write. Sure. Yeah. Like, my brain was, like, racing because there's so much stuff going on. It was a great way to just kind of go, like, okay, what am I going to do with this energy? On the road with Little Feet. You know, what are you going to do? At, like, one in the morning, like, after a gig. Still not ready to go to sleep. Right. Yeah. But is, was there a way that you were trying to approach, let's say, each of the songs, or were there certain things you're trying to, or was it, this is just an idea that comes to my head, and I'm going to... I'm not going to give away my secrets. Okay, deal, deal. That's I got fine. some secrets going <laughs> here, and I'm not giving them away. I respect that. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But each one starts somehow. Uh-huh, sure. And, and then from then, you're just going to keep then, writing And that's the great thing about it. I just, you can hear it. Like, I write, I, I don't always have a keyboard with me. Uh -huh. I mean, I don't always use a keyboard. I start. I don't have a perfect pitch. Yeah. But a lot of times, once once I got my framework in there, I'm just looking at shit and getting inspired and trying things, and moving around like, oh, what the, I try this. Yeah. You know, I just started having fun because I try to get the framework in. Mm -hmm. I'll say that much. I try to get a framework in, and then to start building it out. Okay, sure. You know. And this is what this is what came of it. But it seems like what's so interesting to me about it is it does really have that like. It isn't like here's a piece from this time or here's a piece from this time or here's all the stuff that you're doing. It's like all everything is one cohesive thing that you created that really does seem like it comes directly well, it, from your experience. It's all, experience it's all, it is, and it's also probably all from like a year mm -hmm. or maybe a year and a half. Sure. So it was like this stuff that was kind of popping around in here. Yeah. Sure. You know, and so it's like, okay, well, let's get it out. So that's the and that's the first of the community music. Right. What's right. going on with the other community music? Say, wow. Well, only a record one. Okay. It's gonna be like <laughs> tomorrow by the time we're done. Um, volume two, I call Good Time Music, and it's with Cat Russell. And that's really that I didn't even intend to be a record. None of this stuff. I, first of all, none of this stuff I intended to be a record. I got a grant, and all I wanted to do was document my arrangements. Mm -hmm. So the idea was. I have a lot of food set up every day. Originally, the idea was much more grandiose. And I realized if I really wanted to get as many arrangements as possible, then I should just have the same guys, same setup, so we're not like resetting mics, which you think isn't going to take a time, but guess what? It takes a lot of time. And all I want to do is record music. Yeah. I got enough money for four days in the studio. Rehearse a song for 40 minutes. Cut it twice. 
move on. That's it? That's it. Do you do overdubs or any kind of thing? Uh, the end of maybe the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest bit at the end. Not much. Okay. But everything in Tinctures of Time as well is like, you do two takes, call mm-hmm. it a day, and that's what you get. Not call it a day. Go well, to the next call song. Call it the next song, right. But call I mean, it the next song. No, right, right, right. Yeah, next song. For that piece, anyway. I'd say maybe one piece I really wanted to get that we were just kept not getting, I might have had to do five times. Okay. Because it was an important piece to me, and it was not easy, and we'd never done it live. Sure. And we may have had to do it five times. But the principle of it is very live. It's very... No, we're just going to play it twice and we're going to go to the next song. Yeah. It's not I'm making a record. It's I want to get a good version of each song. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I know what what it sounds like. Because I don't know what these songs sound like. Sure. I don't know what these songs sound like. I want to know what these songs sound like. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cat stuff, I said, well, I'm going to do this so I have something to play for promoters so I can get gigs for this. Everyone played so amazing. Cat sang so great. I was just like, whoa. I'm listening to my, my room. My wife walks in like, what are you listening to? This is amazing. Like, it's pretty deep, man. And it's like, because it's that stuff I learned from Levon and Henry. But it's us now. Like, sure. they're not here anymore. So, but those lessons have been learned. Yeah, sure. But I'm not, I'm not playing for Levon anymore. Henry's not here. Like, this is, like, how I think about it. Right, sure. And we're going, and bam, 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 Borowski plays. We do this version of, of Yes We Can. It's incredible. Like, it's like, seriously, Ben plays one of the greatest drum performances I've ever heard. Wow. Anyways, I'm super happy with it because, you know, and people love music with songs. You know, a lot of people listen to words and everything. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So anyway, that's the second record. And then the third record is also I just did really the document because I wanted to document as many of the arrangements I did with Henry mm-hmm. as possible because that's just going to get farther and farther away. Right. So it's really important to me when I not, before I got too far away to just record as many as I sure. could. These are ones that you wrote but were never recorded. Right. Never recorded the stuff. And guess what? They're all amazing. So I was like, okay, I'm making a record out of this. <laughs> and... That's pretty good. And the fourth record was really the warm-up day. I was like, warm-up day, I was like, let's just do a bunch of, like, un- a bunch of my arrangements of songs that we've never recorded that I like. So it's a typical. It's like, you know, Ellington, Mingus, The Beatles, The Grateful Dead, Eddie Harris, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's... So one guy, was like, the guy who does my arm was like, I think I like this record best. I was like, huh. I thought that was, like, the throwaway record. Sure. But it's also, it's not because... I'll tell you something... Uh, you know, the way we play this music, you know, 15 years ago, Joel Dorn said to me, I thought I'd never hear this sound again. 15 years ago. Maybe it was 18 years ago. Like, this sound that we're carrying on, and now we're a lot better, comes from, you know, Ellington and the Ray Charles bands, and that's the music we grew up listening to. Sure. So that's... Not many people are using that as their, like... Mother's milk. Okay. You know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's just natural for us. This is like what mm-hmm. we do. And so I think it sounds pretty good, man. And then it's Bessie Smith. You know, it's like, it's good. And the, and the arrangements get better. My arrangements are better now than they were before. And sure. everyone's just so much better at playing. And they're recorded great. So, yeah. So that's volume four. That's great. Was it how, how every you, four months? Every four I, months. I thought it was every three one. months, and then they said, "Oh, I, I, I thought we were every three months." I'm like, well, that's already out for every you know whatever the record people. Are. I'm like, whatever. Every four months. That sounds stupid to me, but that's what know. it is. Well, yeah, sure. I think every three months sounds better, but yeah. it's not. Well, I don't know. You get, it, you get it out in a year. I don't. I know. Know. I know. Stupid. Well, I'll be looking forward to hearing them anyway. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. And then you got another Sex Mob record. Yes. And I haven't officially done the paperwork, so I can't really announce. The label, but it's a super cool label. And right. um, I was very pleased. The label action, it's cool, but almost nobody knows about it. But we like here, like, we know about most of the stuff I do. So, But it's, like, super exclusive and great. Sure. Cool. Um, okay. And it's this record. We actually record this a month before we did the MTO stuff. Scotty Hart and I have been saying, man, we got to make another record while we're still on the planet. We've been saying this for years. <clears throat> Finally found a time where... He had some free time and all of us were around. So what he did was he sent me um, 
tracks. Some were beats, some were loops. One was like a six minute through composed electronic piece. It was like different tempos, because the drum machine changed the tempo, like mm -hmm. different things. And so I wrote a piece for each thing, track he sent me. Cool. And then we recorded it in two days. And now, then the pandemic hit. And Scott's also, you know, a paraplegic and has some issues sometimes with his health. So might not be able to work for a month or two, unfortunately. Now, hopefully it's past that. But it took a while. It's almost two years. And he just finished it. In fact, we're doing the final mixes Thursday and Saturday of oh, the wow. last song. Okay. But it's amazing sounding, man. Like, and the guests, it's really cool. The guests are Bedeski, Vijay, and DJ Olive. We got uh, Scott got Vijay to play a song, which I think is really cool. That's because, great. Because, you know, he's kind of from a generation, a not kind of, he's from a generation after us, but so related in so many circles and really related to Scott. And, of course, his love of, like, Roscoe Mitchell and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I first met him around those people. So yeah. it's very... And he's on the old, he's on some of the old Sex Mob records. Like no, VJ? No. Not VJ. Um, well, Medeski's been there since the beginning. No, Medeski and DJ Olive, yeah. too. Isn't he on, like... Well, he's not on a record, but when we toured Sexotica, okay. he did the tour. Yeah. No, DJ Logic's on the second one. Okay, I think that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, of, DJ yeah. Olive is a much different D than DJ Logic. You know, DJ All, you know, DJ Logic is, you know, DJ Logic. You know, D DJ All is like a, he's like Fellini. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah. So let me wait. Let me ask you now about. We got to do a little sex mob. Yeah. First of all, how did you end up starting to play slide trumpet? Well, I had one. Come on, I told the story so many times. Oh, sorry. Well, if you need to give the short version. <sighs> okay. There is no. Sh there are no short versions of me, Bobby. <laughs> Woodstock, 1977. I'm a creative music studio. I'm in a car with someone. You know, I'm 14. No, I'm 15. Okay, you're 70, 15 at the Creative Music Studio, hanging out with... 77, whoever. Some guy's got a car. He has to go to Woodstock, too, because it's right outside of Woodstock. Uh-huh. And, and you're coming from California. Yeah, you know. The, not, creative Music Studio, I get in a car with this guy. He's going to Woodstock. Me and Peter Apple are in the car. Going to a guitar shop. For some reason, it's like across that little creek in Woodstock. Go in. On the wall are two slide trumpets with a sign next to them. It says $25. I'm like, I can't even sign. He's like, those things are $25? The guy's like, yeah, $25. So I'm like, I'm getting one. Peter's like, I'm getting one. So that's how I started playing the side trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> what, kind, what was it? It's that like Getson, you know, with the little... The little... The little Getson with the yeah. knob. But the guys were just trying to get rid of it. Sure. It's, it's like on the People wall. People like, what are we doing with this? Yeah, right. $25. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's got amazing. It. That's how I started playing the side trumpet. When did you find that... So you practiced this for a while. You got I didn't practice it. That, that's another story. So I just could play stuff on it. And I, it, I played, I think I ended up playing a little bit of Foreign Legion in the, in the early 80s. I can't remember. Like, I brought it out to, with me. I can't remember playing it with the Malibu Dolphins. But, you know, Foreign Legion, I played it. And then Spanish Fly started playing it. I could only play it in a few keys. But we had these couple songs I did. And when I did it, people really reacted. Mm -hmm. Like... And we're on our first tour, and Dave Douglas is on his first tour as a leader. And we're on our first tour as our own band. And we run into each other in Germany. Listen to the set. Dave, you know, is like, got the hyper brain, where it's like, everything goes like right in the place of me, like, and we're hanging out. He's an old friend, right? He says, man, why don't you practice that thing? I'm like, yeah, why don't I practice that thing? So I started practicing. And then that begat Sex Mob. Because then I thought to myself, what well, if I start a band where all I play is a slide trumpet? I'll be forced to figure out how to play this thing. Sure. Because I'm going to be up here and that's all I'm going to do. And that's, when we started Sex Mob, we would do two sets a night uh, at the tap bar, Thursday at 11 o'clock. So first set at 11, second set like whatever, 12.30, 1 in the morning. I couldn't play anything. I was spitting dust for the first six months, man. Because I didn't couldn't play well enough to, like, you know, I'd like blow it all out the first set. You know, I'm going to get a little bit out of the second set, but it's pretty bad. That's how I learned to play slide trumpet. Interesting. And did you then, 
when did you up? What did you? Because there are there are a couple of slide trumpets floating around, but it's not something that everybody makes. Like you had to find like. Well, no, no, I didn't find one. Dick made me one. Okay. Dick sure. Ackwright. What happened was I said, okay, I'm gonna start this band. I should get a real horn. So I go see Dick Ackwright in Oakland, who I've known since I was, I guess, in sixth grade, and uh, I say to him, man, Dick, uh, could you make me this? Oh, guys, calm down. Could you make me a horn? He said, yeah. He said, what do you got? He said, uh, I had this Kong Constellation I don't use. You know, I bought for 75 bucks up in Portland. But I know they're, he says, well, you know what, man? The Marachi guys love those horns. They all want them. I'll get 800 bucks for it. So look, you just give me that. I'll, I'll build you a horn. And he built me a horn. And, it's, and what he did, I'm pretty sure, is that he cut down a Bach alto trombone slide. I should double check, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's what he did. Okay. And everything else he just built himself. Sure. And Dick's just a master dude. We do, you can say no if you don't want, we can push him away. Because oh, otherwise he's just not gonna stop. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Nurdle, leave him alone. Come here. So anyway, that's the story of the slide trumpet. And that's the story of Dick's. And once I got that, you know, as you can see from my room, I've experimented, but that horn Dick made by Intuition. Mm -hmm. He looked at my Getzen, and the Getzen was built out. Yeah. And so you had regular trombone, the bells in third position, and then fourth position when you get to the other side. On my horn, it's it's fourth position, it's fifth position, sixth position. Okay. It's all. But what that does is, it puts the bell away from your face. Sure. It puts a crook of the bell. Mm -hmm. Problem is, slide trumpet is such a difficult instrument. If you're at all having to think about how you put that horn on your face, you've lost the game. Sure. Like, that's a hard. If you got to go for once, like, uh, how do I? Yeah, I see what you're saying. You've already lost. Right. It's too hard to even think about that. You yeah. needed to have in the most, because it's, it's a bit weird to, like, you're holding it like, this, you know what I'm saying? Like this. And it's not like a trombone kind of balances here. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing is, like, really important. And Dick somehow intuitively realized, I don't know if he realized, it just, he lucked out. So all the other horns, where they built the thing back here, you're just going like, uh, 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 yeah, can get some notes out of it. But after a while, I'm like, you don't want to play all night like that. Yeah. It's going to be, you're doing a, it's going to be bad. Sure. Right. So that's the story why my horn is like, I, I try to get them, man. I get every horn I can to like try it out. But, mm -hmm. you know. So you started. So you start Sex Mob, and then you had that. You had a regular gig. We had a regular gig, and that gig. gave you the opportunity to work out all these different covers and new tunes. And well, what happened things. was we didn't do covers at first. Okay. All original music, and um, with Hal, it was getting me more and more involved with like movie music. Mm -hmm. I think, and John Lurie, we were doing movie music too. So I'm doing movie music with two guys. I said, Well, I better learn about movie music. So, no internet really. I mean, maybe it was the internet, but it wasn't like a big thing. So I just buy records of film scores and start listening to them. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's, let's see what do film scores sound like. I got to do film scores. I buy a Bond film score. I hear this cute Bond with bongos like. This is dope. So what I would do, I just really scratch out really quick, like all the parts on one page. Mm -hmm. Brought to whatever, Kinko's, whatever, make copies of it. Passes the guys. We're doing our regular music. Well, it starts off just out, big and bop, 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 like the bass trombone note. Yeah. Bottom the alto. King's like, and then they, you know, Tony, Tony's playing like the, this is probably like, you know, muted trumpet or trombone or something on it. And it's like, you know, I'm going, the usual stuff. Like, nothing's really changing, like, what we've kind of known we've been doing. And then it's like, the place goes, And I'm like, oh, I see. Give them something they know, they're going to be like, Music, we yeah. love this stuff. <laughs> so. You know, you play something they don't know, it's the same thing. But they know or they don't know it. Yeah. 
If yeah. something hits people, you know, when they're familiar with it, especially music like that, movie music and what have you, it's always been a part of the whole... Well, anything, man. When we hit the big chorus of Ruby Tuesday, it's the same thing. It's the yeah, right audience. Sure. You know, people go like... And they're like... Ah. Yeah. You know, because it's just like this feeling of whatever. I don't know what it... Because it's different for every person, but it's, it's, it's science. Sure. So once I realized that, I was like, okay... What other tunes can I do this with? And that's literally how it started. Sure, and that's what you think about if you're going to if you're going to write an arrangement or bring in a new tune for the how band. This, can we do this melody? How can we pull pull something off this yeah. melody? Whatever. But it's interesting because Sign of the Times is something I thought about for years before I had my own band. Because for me, the melody of that song is in the bass. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. And I was on a gig, you know, uh, you know, kind of we do these gigs and these kind of bar, like funk bands, original music. There's a lot of that stuff, you know. No one ever got recorded. Sure. There were a lot of, like, original music bands playing, like, New York funk in the 80s. So there's a lot of work doing that. Probably something with the band. My friend Gene Perez, like, from Jersey, I think. He's on stage, like, and he used to wear, like, gloves, like a glove with thumbs, no thumbs. Yeah. I'm like, gee, what is that? He goes, oh, this new Princeton. And Gene was like, he played with, um, he still plays with um, uh, Willie Colon. He's so funky, man. It's crazy. So I always had that melody in my head. Like, you know, that's a great melody. Sure. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we'll play that tune and we never get to the, melody, the written melody. It's just... It's that, and maybe there's so much improvisation that by the time we're already in another song, by the time sure. the melody was coming. Yeah. But sometimes those bass lines are so iconic, that's all you need. It's, just, it's like, well, it's like it's, uh, Walk on the Wild Side yeah. or any of these things. Right. It's like that's, that's as the much melody. the melody as anything. Yeah. Same with uh, All You Need Is Love. Mm -hmm. All You Need Is Love, the melody's from the bass line. Sure. Huh. I realized it in Line at the Deli. <laughs> line at the Deli in Naya. Listen, you know, if you got music on, I'm listening. I'm listening to the song. What am I, what am I singing? Boom, 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 Wow, who'd have thought? Yeah, right. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. We have covered a lot of ground. I will often ask this, and I think you may have some insight on this. For people coming up now in the music world, what advice do you have for younger people trying to play music, get into music? Create a community. I always tell people this. I remember Lou Soloff gave me, like, at times it felt like really nasty advice and it was the best advice anyone ever gave me. <laughs> I'd done a tour with Carl Blay. I'd been really cool with Lou. Because I knew at that point Lou was the king of New York and everyone's like, you know, trying to be political. And you know, blah, blah, blah. And in the tour I said, Lou, I'm not asking for you. I love Dr. John. It's my favorite music. Yeah. I said, how would this love to like, you know, subtle rehearsal you can't make it? Who says, well, Steve, he goes, you know, I only ask really good trumpet players to do that. You know, like Chris Bodie or Randy Brecker. I mean, you should just keep playing with your friends. And I was like, oh. Like, oh. <laughs> That's cold, man. But guess what? Guess what? I kept playing with my friends. And guess what? Every time I played with Dr. John, it was with my friends. Sure. Oh, well, it was the best advice ever. <laughs> right. That's amazing. It was sure. The best advice ever. Even the time I thought, oh. Right. But it turned out to be. Right. You just keep playing with your friends. You know, I mean, there was already beginning to be less, so much less of a base of commercial work. God, dog hair all over <laughs> A base of commercial work when I came up. There was. Yeah. Now there's really none. Sure. You know, it really isn't. The environment has changed a lot even when I was a kid looking right. at what is the possibilities here. So, so figure out you can get as many skills as possible. I mean, we don't talk about, like, you know, a third of my money comes from being a, rock, a great rock and roll trumpet player. Sure. A third of my money. Sometimes half my money. Yep. 
And if no, how would it be a great rock and roll trump player? Playing rock and roll? Playing the drum trump solo. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Sure. That taught me how to be a rock and roll trump player. And my trumpet teacher would give me Louis Armstrong solos to play as etudes. Uh-huh. Because when you need to learn to play in the upper tessitura in rhythm. Yeah. Sure. It's not like you're going, it's like, ba 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 Like, you know, and you got to, like, play those notes in time and make them sound huge and great. Yeah. And if you can do that, you can play the hell out of rock and roll. Trumpet. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Right. I said, people don't even realize, they're, like, coming here little feet. They hear Louis Armstrong. Sure. Yeah. Really yeah. So get as many skills as possible. And I think for young people, a lot of that has to do with like digital editing and those kind of skills, making beats. No, don't leave him alone. <laughs> you know, making beats is obviously a huge thing. I mean, he doesn't make his name, but the trumpet player who's like so successful now is like Natalie Kessman's old boyfriend. You know, uh, what's called? I, oh, Ivan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what's his thing called? They're, they're huge, right? Uh, brass tracks. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, and he picked up his own thing. You know, he came up with his own approach he or whatever. He his own thing. Yeah. And his thing is very digital, and he figured that out. So, I mean, there's things to do out there, but you need to be, keep creating. Is it okay? Looks like, oh, you know what I bet happened is the dog stepped on it. Uh-oh. Well, that was recently, hopefully. Yeah, it is. Okay. 125. Hold on. We're going to keep this going. Okay. I have this as a backup, so okay. we got a lot of that anyway. Myrtle, I'm going to take you for a walk as soon as we're done with this. Well, you want to come and walk? Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, I'm going to use this. Yeah, all right. Is it not working or is it working? I don't know. It's doing this little thing where it's like trying to get, it's trying to save everything, but that's okay. We got it. We got a lot of information. We got a lot of information. Yeah. We're going to be okay. Yeah. All right, I got one last one for you. Okay. 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 Um, do you think, so this brings us back to the community music thing, so that's all good. Do you think about your personal style as a trumpet player, or do you? is it just an amalgamation of all the things that you're involved with that you play? Yeah. Like, do you ever think to yourself, like, I'm a... At this such and such a thing, or I'm well, trying to do this. Well, I'll tell you something this. interesting. Many people haven't really heard me play valve trumpet. They don't really know what I play like. Okay. Probably you, too. I mean, you haven't heard me play that uh, much. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, I've heard you play it, okay. but I know what you're saying. Yeah. And I made this record with Joe Filer this, oh, like six months ago. And it's great, because Joe also likes to write the trombone, the top voice. So I'm playing a lot of second, third voice. It's like, oh, it's cool, like yeah. trombone, soprano, and trumpet with trombone as the top voice. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, there's no, like, head trips about how to worry about getting to this note because, like, like, everything's, like, you know, just very attainable. Sure. And I just got to play as well as I could. There's a lot of different horns, probably four or five different horns, like, maybe ten different mutes because he's willing to mute. So, you know, within a song, we'll be switching mutes. Mm -hmm. Kenny Rampton heard it. He goes, man, people have no idea what a good trumpet player you are. I'm like, yeah, man, I could play trumpet a long time now, man. I mean, I'm not, like... I have a very specific technique, but it's pretty unique and it's, in a way, very formidable. Sure. And uh, he said, man, the way I love it, I said, man, you're like a perfect mixture of, of, of Dizzy, Clark Terry, and Lester Bowie. You know? Because, like, Clark Terry, because that's like that kind of preciseness, rhythmic preciseness. Yeah. But at the same time, letting every note have a lot of personality. Yeah. But being very rhythmically accurate. Like, to me, it's very important to be rhythmically accurate. If that's what the job calls for. Sure, uh-huh, for sure. Otherwise, you're going to get fired. Right, yes. And then Dizzy, because I'm really into harmony, man. Mm -hmm. I, and I like to have fun with harmony. We were talking about this earlier. I like to hear how different chords sound against each other. Sure. So I'm always having fun. I'm always trying to have some harmonic fun. Yeah. And I think Dizzy, that was one of Dizzy's things, man. He was taking all that diminished stuff and how many different ways can you go over tune because he you know he was literally the first guy that started writing vamps sure mm -hmm. and like how many different things can you throw against a vamp yeah sure and and then Lester because I you know I use I as that whole vocabulary Lester did where like you're pushing against like the idea of a trumpet as just one note but just maybe you can bend the sound and that yeah. kind of stuff you mm -hmm. know and he heard it and that's kind of in a sense that's kind of I mean there's a lot of influences but those are kind of like the big three sure as far as trumpet. Yeah. You know. 
But you came to those over from over, your own. Yeah. Just the. But it sounds like it doesn't sound like any of those guys. Not like, no, right. It's not like Dizzy Gillespie. It's not like Clark Derry. I'm right. Like, that's a sound like yourself. Right. But you hear these those things. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks. This has been great, man. I Super appreciate fun, you man. doing it. Yeah. Thank you, Bobby. And people keep listening to Jazz Utopia. Is that what it's called? No, Jazz. Jazztopia. Okay, so again. Yeah. So again. <laughs> people keep listening to Jazztopia. <laughs> All right, great. Awesome. All right, gang, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Huge thanks to Stephen Bernstein for joining me on the program this week. Be sure to check out his new album, Tinctures in Time, Community Music Volume 1, on his Bandcamp page at stephenbernstein.bandcamp.com. Be sure to support the artist, buy the album. All right, I think he might have some vinyls as well, so I think you can order that. Uh, check it out. Be sure to check it out. It's an amazing album. It's like you've, nothing you've ever heard before. Guaranteed. Nothing like nothing else. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. Uh, be sure to join us again next week. We've got an amazing, we got an amazing show lined up for you. Can't tell you what it is. You're gonna have to check it out. All right, we got some really great shows lined up, and I'm super excited. So I hope you'll follow the show. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, you can follow the show on whatever your favorite podcast thing is. You can check it out on on uh, SoundCloud and Spotify and uh, all the places where you find podcasts. Apple Music, Apple Podcasts. And be sure to check out our page on YouTube. If you're listening to this in y your headphones, uh, go over to YouTube and check it out. You can check out the video version. And we've got a, we've got a YouTube channel up and running. All right, gang. Well, thanks again for sticking around, checking out another episode of Jazztopia. And we'll catch you next time.